Well, thank you very much for that warm welcome, and uh, thank you, Hugh and Andy, for inviting me to this wonderful conference. And uh, I've had an extremely enjoyable day listening to all the wonderful speakers, um, especially Hugh, you know, I mean, he's like, <coughs> well, he said nice things about me. That's the least I can do. <laughs> okay, so um, my research kind of took a, a, a diversion after the Giza power plant was published. And people would come to me and say, when are you going to write another book? And I would say, well, um, I'm not in the business of writing books, you know, and uh, if, if I have something I uh, found that I want to write about, I, then I would write another book. But I'm not just going to, you know, uh, write books. I've got a lot of work to do professionally. Uh, then, as luck would have it, and Providence, uh, several trips back to Egypt, including one, a fateful trip in 2006, when I uh, went on the John Anthony West tour in February, a un unbelievable uh, aspect of manufacturing precision that I had didn't think uh, was possible in ancient Egypt. I was the artifacts that I had measured were generally. Uh, not very sophisticated in modern terms as far as geometries go. You had uh, <coughs> radii, um, uh, you had flat surfaces, uh, albeit very precise flat surfaces. I mean, the, the smoking gun at the Serapium is one of the giant boxes with a, an extraordinary precision. And I deal with that in my second book, Lost Technologies, uh, <coughs> because following that trip in, in, in uh, February, I was looking at uh, some of the photographs that I had, and I realized that I had to go back. And so I went back in, in May of that year. Um, I upgraded my camera and also uh, got a, a high quality tripod uh, <coughs> to uh, be able to affix my camera and take some photographs that. Uh, were hopefully uh, in accordance with the axes, the different axes on, on, uh, on the statues. And, <clears throat> and then at the end of that, I realized that, hey, I had enough material to, to write another book. Um, I wrote The Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt. And um, after writing The Giza Power Plant, I. I realized that really I was, uh, I was not going to crack open any, uh, any fissures in the academic community. Uh, it seemed like a bridge too far to a lot of people, even some in our field. Uh, but I, I just followed up with the Lost Technologies, which I considered to be the thin end of the wedge that would eventually open things up. As it turns out, um, it has become um, a, a bit of a classic now in Egypt. And the other thing that had occurred to me was that if, I was, if there was going to be a revolution in thought on ancient Egypt and Egyptology, then that revolution had to come from within Egypt itself. And so I have attempted to engage with Egyptian engineers. I've succeeded. Um, and my book is now in the, the gift shop or a bookstore in Aswan. And that's, that particular photograph um, was taken in 2018. And um, it was still there la last March when I was there. Also, I communicated with a uh, professor, Galal Hassan, from Cairo. Uh, he's a Cairo University professor. and. He was writing articles on ancient technologies and the engineering of the ancient builders. And uh, I was alerted to one article that he had written. It was a peer-reviewed article. And he, had, uh, he told me that uh, in that article, he had cited my work seven times. So I sent him a, uh, an email. He responded. And we met in Luxor. Shortly afterwards, I presented him with lost technologies of, the, uh, of ancient Egypt. 
And uh, so <clears throat> the book is now in the hands of several uh, Egyptian engineers. Then on that trip, I uh, met a guy who was the legal overseer for the Scan Pyramid project. His name is Hamada Anwar. And he was a very charming guy, uh, very pleased to receive my book. And I was very pleased to hear that while he was overseeing the mission, uh, Zai Hawass was trying to shut it down. <laughs> and, uh, and he essentially uh, told Hawass to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so he, is, he is not a part of the political chain. I think he is what you might call an oligarch. He, um, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't count out to the political class. Um, and then we come to the Giza power plant. So it was during those trips that, that I, I uh, began to formulate um, an, a, a different approach to what my, my future days would be. Uh, <clears throat> having re been in uh, research in this since 1977, and the past few years going through uh, several life-threatening uh, illnesses, I began to think about, okay, if I was going to spend uh, my last days on Earth, what is the, the main thing I need to do? Do I need to go down to Pungapunku again? No. Do I need to gather more information on uh, ancient machining? No. The thing is, I'll tell you a little story. I did uh, online discussions, you know, on bulletin boards. And uh, it was after an article that I, I had published in Analog Magazine. And it was called Advanced Machining in Ancient Egypt. And in this, on this discussion board, <coughs> I was accused of being a lone voice shouting into the wilderness and nobody was listening. <laughs> and this was uh, basically uh, an article that focused on uh, some of the artifacts in the, the Petrie Museum, which you all know of, it's down the road. And so <coughs> that, uh, that has changed. Now there are thousands of engineers going through Egypt. Uh, I have taken dozens of engineers myself. I've been around dozens of engineers in Egypt coming from all over the world. And they are definitely engaged. They see, uh, they see these artifacts through the same eyes I, I'm looking through uh, with the same background and they are agreeing. So when it comes to uh, the concept of peer review, uh, I'm very happy that uh, my work has uh, resonated with my peers, which are actually technologists, those who uh, actually do the work. And if we were to, if we were to say, okay, let's build a pyramid power plant today, <coughs> we probably won't be uh, hiring any Egyptologists to help us. <laughs> Not that I have anything against the Egyptologists. You know, well, not much. <laughs> so um, I wrote, of course, you know, uh, t talking to engineers and being an engineer, and uh, being a, an engineer both in the UK and also the States, and having worked in several places around the States, several companies, um, wherever you go, you find a different culture. You know, their language is slightly different. The way they describe things is a little different. And there's no two engineers who will actually take a project uh, and design it and execute it the same way. In fact, my experience has been that uh, if I get a job and I design the processes and and do the work, and then I'm off doing something else. That job comes back, and it goes to another engineer. They'll be <coughs> they'll be hell bent on finding another way to do it. That's just the nature of people. They want to put their own personal stamp on it. But uh, the the bottom line is is that while we all have different views and different interpretations, um, the evidence that we 
we are actually looking at doesn't change. It's, uh, it's there. It's there to, to be verified. And, you know, if you want to come up with a, a different idea on how things are done, then, you know, go see the evidence. Do your own measurements. Uh, if you don't agree with my measurements, do your own. Come up with your own interpretation. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to how do you do the work? What, what tools do you use? And, uh, and essentially, you've got to prove your ideas. And that's the beauty of, of my, that's one thing I really enjoy about my, uh, my research and, and, and the path that I've taken is that um, it's, the evidence is unambiguous. You can go to the Giza Plateau, uh, you can look at the same artifacts I did, you can take your own measurements, you can observe, and, uh, and, and come up with, pretty much you'll come up with the same thing. Because uh, <coughs> measurements are modern instruments, don't lie. And, you know, it's uh, people who actually use them, they may shade it a little bit, but you can't shade it enough or exaggerated enough to actually dismiss the perfection and the accuracy and precision that you find in Egypt. So uh, when I proposed the theory of the Great Pyramid as a power plant, I said I'm, I'm not adamantly uh, adhering to any one proposition. Uh, the possibilities may be numerous. Uh, I, I, this, is, this is my interpretation. This is how I think it worked. This is the evidence that I use to uh, formulate that opinion. Uh, and if somebody has a different interpretation they want to present it, then they should. So, essentially, and fundamentally, the, uh, the Earth is the driver of the, uh, the Giza power plant. It is a dynamic body and supports civilization. Demand for fuel and, and has done it for centuries. The Great Pyramid responds to the Earth's energies, uh, both mechanically and electrically. And the interesting thing is that my, my initial observation was that because of the acoustic qualities of the Great Pyramid, its dimensions and its relationship as an intica to the Earth's dimensions, uh, in that it's harmonically coupled mechanically, I, uh, I was focusing more on the mechanical energy and when I made my <coughs> uh, interpretation, I, uh, I thought that if there was the electri any electrical activity, then that would be related to the quartz in, in the granite uh, in the, uh, the king's chamber. But why, why would somebody actually even think that a pile of rocks could be a, a power plant? Well, actually ga gathering the, the data, the measurements, and, you know, William Flinders Petrie uh, uh, did some... Uh, Decade, he did a couple of decades of work in Egypt, and his measurements are what I relied on to determine that over a scale of 13 acres, you have a building that if you scaled it down to the size of what we know as a machine, or see as a machine on a daily basis, um, you would have a more precise machine than what, than what we need to generate. We have uh, the shaft, the descending passage. If you go to, uh, <laughs> if you go and look, just hold your thumbnail up, and it's, your thumbnail is about 20 thousandths of an inch thick, and that passageway is aligned within the thickness of a thumbnail, and that's over 150 feet. That makes engineers sit up and take notice. If you look at the uh, joints in the Queen's Chamber, and you see that there is, you can't even fit a piece of paper. 
cigarette paper between them, uh, between those joints. I mean, that is a, a, a precision that is extraordinary, particularly from a time where that they were supposed to be using copper chisels, stone balls, and wooden mallets. But there's a lot of other features within the Great Pyramid, and essentially, I, as I describe in the, the, Great, uh, the Giza power plant, uh, <coughs> the, the, the source of the energy is the Earth. Now, the uh, ascending passage is related to the movement of sound within the, uh, the Grand Gallery. But what happens was that they had a, uh, what, they call, what I call a, a resonant chamber, the King's Chamber, that uh, was forced to vibrate. Uh, and uh, it vibrated at a high energy level. Um, hydrogen was created in the Queen's Chamber. I call that the reaction chamber. And there's evidence to support that particular theory. Um, in that there are residual substances that support that, um, and also just the function of, of the entire system. So with hydrogen being generated in the Grand Gallery, what you have is uh, a series of resonators that gather the Earth energies coming through the pyramid, converts that energy to airborne sound, which is then focused into the King's Chamber, causing the uh, granite to move significantly. So in the uh, Queen's Chamber, they, the shafts terminated five inches before to the inside of the wall. So <coughs> um, I propose that the, there were two fluids, two chemicals that came together in that chamber and there was a reaction that boiled off hydrogen. Now the uh, evidence to sh prove that or to support that is the, uh, essentially that five inch left, or that piece that wasn't cut out. Uh, if you know the head pressure of a shaft containing a fluid, then you have a certain uh, flow or percolation rate through the granite membrane. This is known science. Um, <clears throat> and so if you have a shaft that's uh, totally, you know, it's full, you've got on one side, um, dilute hydrochloric acid and on the north side you have hydrated zinc. When they come together then you have uh, hydrogen. I kind of demonstrated that on ancient aliens. I don't know if anybody saw it. but So uh, the Queen's Chamber shafts were closed on both ends in 1992. Uh, Brink was cleaning out the the uh, shafts of the King's Chamber, and, uh, and then he turned his attention to the Queen's Chamber shaft because nobody had found the, the exit point of the Queen's Chamber shaft. So he went up the southern shaft and he came to what everybody has called a door, <coughs> which, uh, you know, t credit to Mr. Gantenbrink, uh, uh, understanding that that shaft is only eight inches square, what kind of door would that be for what? And he called it a USO, an unidentified stone object. <laughs> Smart guy. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, what you find, the other evidence you find in there is that uh, you have evidence of erosion, which uh, uh, yeah, one of the arguments, uh, and I've, uh, believe it or not, I've received some criticism for that book, uh, and, and one of them was, well, you know, hydrochloric acid and, and limestone just wouldn't mix. And it's like, um, yeah, and it didn't. Do you see the erosion on that, on that, uh, on the floor of that shaft? Uh, but I, also in the book, I uh, illustrated uh, what was, what I predicted would be found behind this Ganton Brinks USO if they were ever able to uh, get behind it. And, uh, and so there was a, a 3.64 illustrated inches. It was just like, uh, okay, if, as an engineer, I'm looking at eight, eight inch square and I want to put a couple of electrodes through that 
you know, how thick do, would I need the door? Oh, the USO, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> as it turns out, in 2002, they, um, they penetrated the door with a drill. I'm going to use door. You'll, you'll figure it out. Uh, and they used an ultrasonic thickness tester, and uh, they found that the uh, thickness of the block was 3.25 inches, so fairly close. Um, what they found behind it, <coughs> they did that with the uh, Pyramid Rover. Um, their equipment wasn't uh, sophisticated enough to scan around uh, behind the door, and so they just had a straight on shot with an endoscope. Uh, so that kind of gave you like a fisheye lens view, which is distorted, obviously. But uh, I, I, I proposed that there was a downward shaft, and uh, that a downward shaft would actually deliver the fluid to the uh, to the back of the door, which would flow into the sh into the uh, the southern shaft, <coughs> because it, it was important that they knew that. Uh, when the, the fluid level was dropping, because if the fluid level was dropping, then the head pressure was dropping. And so uh, they had to have some way uh, where they, they, they would receive a signal that the, water, the uh, chemical level had fallen. Um, I'm not sure about the veracity of this. I mean, it's, they, uh, it, it did appear that there was a, a rectangular feature at the back, and so I modified uh, my uh, drawing to include that. <coughs> uh, this was modified in, uh, in 2002. So uh, they were also able to turn to the northern shaft. Kenton Brink had some problems with uh, Upuat because there was uh, a, a couple of rods stuck in the, uh, in the northern shaft on the bend. The, uh, the shafts in, the, in the, the Great Pyramid on the north side actually kink, so they, they have several bends and they bend around the uh, Grand Gallery, then they bend back and then out up to the outside. Now, the Pyramid Rover team uh, were, used a different kind of robot and they, uh, they turned it 90 degrees and grip the walls instead of the floor. And so, uh, using that method, they were able to ride over the obstructions and make their way to the northern uh, block. And, uh, and look what we had there. <coughs> Two electrodes. Sorry, did I tell you I consider them electrodes? <laughs> uh, so two electrodes, uh, but with uh, different features. And you have one of them that has uh, a white substance attached to it. Um, it's similar to what you would have if uh, you were electroplating it. And on, on the southern shaft, if you notice, that they were heavily eroded. And one of the, uh, one of the pins, one of the electrodes, uh, had uh, partly broken off. Interesting. So now, uh, we look for, on the outside, is there something that could indicate that these chemicals could be delivered from the outside into the, into the Great Pyramid? And they have several uh, deep shafts on the outside. This is on the east side. They've also got shafts on the south side. <coughs> the Jedi robot, May 2010. They did some remarkable work. You know, uh, you see that guy there? If I go back to the other photograph of the uh, Pyramid Rover team, it's almost like it's the same guy. <laughs> anyway, maybe it's just me. Probably not. That, as an aside. Um, <coughs> their, their cameras uh, were, or they had a snake that they were able to articulate uh, behind the, uh, the block, and they were able to take images of the features of the pins, 
um, and also uh, photograph the floor. Um, interestingly, when you look at the back of the, uh, this so-called door, uh, the pins on the right uh, it seems to have some kind of a ferrule around it or some kind of a seal. And then on the left, you have uh, a corrosive buildup, uh, similar to what you would find on a battery. <coughs> now on the floor uh, behind there, they had these symbols uh, and also a line. Um, there was a lot of consternation and discussion about what they could mean, and they, uh, they concluded that they were Mason's marks, though I don't know if they knew what, what kind of other skills the Masons had. Uh, maybe they called electricians Masons back then. But uh, well, <laughs> I looked at that and I see a, a couple of connectors and uh, and also a twisted pair. And, and then I went to work to uh, act actually fabricate a replica of the Gant and Brink store uh, in order to uh, test the theory and demonstrate how it works. That happened at Danville Metal Stamping. And uh, it was uh, very interesting. I actually made those, those copper pins a couple of times. Uh, I got the hang of it and finally got them installed. But it was quite, quite a, an interesting design because you have, uh, you have a, a design where the pins come through the hole and then they're bent down and the back there is a loop and it locks into place in the back, which actually will prevent those pins from turning. Pretty ingenious, eh? So yeah, that's the uh, Ganton Brinks door, and I wired up these connectors that the pins slide through, and so there was electrical contact to any leads that uh, would be attached to it. And again, on Ancient Aliens, I demonstrated that it worked without any problems whatsoever. Well, except for the usual vagaries uh, dealing with producers and uh, really nice people. Um, <coughs> no, <laughs> no. Every, uh, every trade have their personalities, and it was a very interesting experience that I had with them. That's for sure. So I uh, I revised the drawing again. You know, this is this is typical engineering. It's not like oh, I've, I've changed my mind. No, I, I mean, I, my mind was changed when more evidence came. And using the scientific method, if new evidence shows up, uh, you have to adjust your theory a little bit, or if you can't adjust it, then the theory has to be thrown out. And so, you know, I'm just saying, hey, I got to change my drawing, and, uh, and everything will work. So the... Uh, so this is the new one where the chemicals are fed from the outside and then they, uh, they flow into the Queen's Chamber and that's where they're mixed. So this brings us to another interesting uh, topic and that is, you know, for any system, any power system or any engineering system, you have maintenance issues. And uh, obviously, as we see, by the dilapidated state of these electrodes, uh, they would eventually have to be changed. And, uh, and so, I <coughs> obviously, I'm thinking, okay, they, at some time they would have to be changed, and uh, they would have to have access to do that. Perhaps not on the, the northern shaft, but at least on the southern shaft. <coughs> and then we come to Jean-Pierre Houdin and his work, and he's describing pyramid internal ramp theory. Um, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. I do think that there are, are, are more features to be found within the Great Pyramid, um, but not necessarily internal ramps for delivering stone, but to, uh, uh, to build the pyramid, but uh, for maintenance functions. 
Now, I'm talking about evidence. This is all evidence, and, and it's kind of an update on the, the Giza power plant, because Giza power plant was uh, published in 1998, and uh, all this information came after it. Uh, which, you know, obviously, uh, that book has to be updated, a sequel has to be written, and uh, maybe one of my kids will write it. No, I'll do it. <laughs> I think I've got a few years left. Uh, the other piece of evidence in the uh, Giza power plant, I propose that the destruction of the, uh, of the, uh, <coughs> the, the Great Pyramid and also is also related to a lot of what was discussed earlier on, uh, as far as uh, cosmic uh, you know, impacts, media impacts and earth changes, uh, cataclysms, where uh, because the uh, Great Pyramid is so finely tuned to the energy of the earth and you know as far as you know any system um, if you want to maximize resonance then uh, you use all the, the knowledge and tools that we have you understanding harmonics um, to uh, achieve maximum transfer of energy uh, <clears throat> and so if they had done that then they had a very finely tuned musical instrument that was drawing energy through it from the earth. Um, and then, if a, you have a comet impact, then you have an influx of energy because before the, this event, uh, the earth was a closed system. And supposedly we know, you know, um, on average, how much energy we can get out of it and using this particular system. And, didn't allow for attenuation of a large input of energy, such as that which a, a comet would introduce into the Earth's plates. And so <clears throat> it became a runaway vibrator, in other words. Um, and a runaway vibrator in science uh, is something that if it cannot attenuate, it cannot absorb, or it cannot release, the energy that it receives, uh, then it will destroy itself. And vibration is everything. I mean, it's, it's used in all our uh, mechanical systems for energy production and transfer, including lasers. Uh, you know, if you have a laser that you put too much in it, energy into it and there's uh, <clears throat> no, no release of that energy, then it will, uh, it will tear apart. I have personal experience with that. I ran a laser job shop in Indianapolis, Indiana, and one of the tubes, uh, one of the cooling tubes came, uh, came off and was spewing cooling water all over the floor. And I had a resonator in the, in the cabinet that was still firing away. Or it was you know, trying to, get, trying to uh, get rid of that heat and there was no water coming through. And then everything shut down. California fires. Hmm? California fires. Oh, whoa, that's a different subject. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> I've heard the rumors though. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but this, is a, this was uh, in the early days of uh, you know, bringing lasers into into uh, manufacturing, and um, it was 1983 uh, when that happened, and the laser was a, it was just a 400 watt YAG, uh, but uh, wow, I, I had to tear the, light, the laser resonator apart, and there was a, a, broken, a broken YAG rod on the inside uh, that needed to be replaced for, to the tune of, $1,800 in 1980, 1983, so a lot of money. Uh, so we go back to the Great Pyramid and what kind of event uh, caused the King's Chamber walls to expand, caused uh, a lot of vitrification inside the, uh, inside the King's Chamber, and uh, we look for evidence, uh, found it, and 2000, oh, 1999 actually, uh, and noticed just a glimmer of it 
in the ceiling of the uh, the ceiling of the, the Grand Gallery. But around that time, there was a uh, a closing of the Great Pyramid. Uh, the internet went nuts because Zahi had closed the pyramid for cleaning, and uh, there was all kinds of rumors that he, he was actually uh, digging a tunnel from his bathroom uh, <coughs> over to the Great Pyramid, and he was he was uh, hell bent on getting behind Ganton Brink's door and removing any evidence of uh, any evidence that doesn't fit their narrative, I should imagine. Anyway. Um, so the Grand Gallery ceiling was fairly dusty. And guess what? In 2001, I was with Zahiroa, so I got permission to uh, go inside the Great Pyramid. They cleaned it, and believe me, they had cleaned it. I mean, that, yeah. Um, and, but well, after they cleaned it, they left uh, scorch marks on the ceiling of the Grand Gallery. Yes, and those scorch marks are directly above the slots where what, what I proposed, where I proposed the uh, the resonator banks were held. So that was a uh, very very exciting discovery. But that was 2001, um, and so yeah, it's another piece of evidence that needs to be incorporated, discussed, and uh, and and then put into the uh, the record. All kinds of damage. Now, when you when I talk about the resonators, this this is the uh, the arrangement that I I proposed that the uh, they were actually located in 27 pairs of, sh uh, of slots that uh, go up the ramps, the side ramps of the uh, of the Grand Gallery, um, <clears throat> and then they're pinned in a in a groove. And but the interesting thing is that those scorch marks are directly above them slots. Something happened. So now we come to um, the resonant tune cavity aspects for pumping hydrogen atoms to a higher energy level. And just how much energy can you expect um, to need to do that? Um, recently, Oh, let me back up a little bit. Getting ahead of myself. Or maybe not far enough for uh, for Hugh, but I'll get I'll get to it. Um, so yeah, um, as I was uh, as I was pondering my future and uh, thinking about what I needed to how I needed to uh, improve. Uh, the theory in the, in the Giza power plant. Uh, one of the aspects that I, I, I uh, landed on was that I needed to do a, to have a more uh, detailed and professional acoustic analysis. Uh, acoustics in the in the Great Pyramid have been noted for many years. Um, it's it's one of the features that people are constantly talking about. Um, when they go to Egypt and they go into the <coughs> king's chamber, um, they remark about it. It has uh, tremendous, tremendous resonance in there. Um, <coughs> now, as far as the uh, features in the king's chamber to support the idea that uh, hyd a hydrogen maser was uh, active in that space, is the uh, a waveguide in the north wall, which is 8.4 inches wide, 4.8 inches high, and then a microwave antenna in the south wall. Um, and you can see them uh, both uh, when you go to, uh, to Egypt. Um, if you go with Andy and his group, or Hugh and his group, um, then you, oh, as far as the, uh, this uh, microwave horn antenna, the, there is a, a fan in there now. Ganton Brink had installed it uh, in the 90s. And uh, <coughs> oh, there it is. And then there's the, uh, the northern shaft. Now, one of the marvelous features of the, uh, of the King's Chamber complex is that 
It is a mechanically isolated from the surrounding bedrock, so there is a gap all the way around it. Um, Danley in 1995, he, or 1996, he was uh, doing some sounding on the, in the, in the uh, King's Chamber, and he remarked that uh, he thought that the, the floor even was suspended on nodes like an egg carton or something like that but that, uh, that, that the uh, vibration or the, that there was no damping. Uh, so the elimination of damping was, was key uh, in order for the uh, power plant to work. So you have the uh, <coughs> a situation where sound energy uh, comes through the King's, the, uh, king's Chamber, vibrates um, the, the granite, uh, the granite moves and it releases tremendous amount of electromagnetic energy. Um, <clears throat> there is a signal, microwave signal coming through the northern shaft, uh, and that it actually stimulates emission in the, um, the, the hydrogen, the excited hydrogen, that uh, then it flows through the southern shaft. That's just a simple overview. Um, and I wrote Blending Science and Music. The ancient Egyptians had tuned their power plant to a natural harmonic of the Earth's vibration, which is predominantly a function of the tidal energy uh, induced by the gravitational effects the Moon has on the Earth. Uh, resonating with the life force of Mother Earth, the Great Pyramid of Giza quickened and focused her pulse and transduced it into clean, plentiful energy. So, in effect, the uh, Great Pyramid was designed like a huge musical instrument uh, and function very well <coughs> until Mr. Media sh showed up. So this is, a, this is a Robert Vaught, my research partner. He's a, a sound engineer and uh, we got to talking in 2016 and um, we wanted to do a, a, a renaissance trip, I mean a reconnaissance trip to Egypt to see the lay of the land uh, to find out if uh, it would be possible to get official permission to do some uh, good uh, sonic sound or acoustic test inside the Great Pyramid with modern equipment. I mean, I mean the technology has uh, improved tremendously since 1996 when Danley was there. So they wanted, he, we were talking about actually uh, doing further tests. Uh, so he uh, in, he had this uh, Tascam uh, microphone, and he was actually found that there was a board at the bottom of the the Grand Gallery that, if you stamped on it, it would resonate. It would there would be a huge boom throughout the Great Pyramid, and so he sampled that and brought it into his software at home. And what you find, uh, which is interesting, and Andy has also written on this with, uh, with a, a colleague about some uh, acoustic uh, sampling that they did in, in, on one of their, one of their tours. And, and so it seems to re we seem to agree with each other that there is a, uh, definitely uh, some very sophisticated acoustics going on in there. But the interesting thing to me was before the introduction of, uh, of sound or before somebody uh, uh, actually made a noise, there was um, infrasonic vibration already existing. It was already being picked up by, by the equipment. And you'll see that right before, you see those yellow dash, yellow lines there, that very low frequency, that blue wave, uh, before you get there, that is the, uh, that is where, when everything was quiet, and that's the sound of the pyramid uh, without any other influence, except the Earth. Now, those wavy lines that you see uh, over there, that's where his wife said, wow, and that's what was <laughs> picked up there. <laughs> but as we look at the, uh, the Great Pyramid as a holistic, uh, sophisticated, uh, well-engineered, well-crafted, beautiful, um, uh, beautiful space. The Grand Gallery is amazing. 
and it was designed for sound, uh, designed to work within a musical instrument. Then we look at some of the concert halls. This is the Follinger Great Hall at Cranach Center, and these are acoustically designed spaces, and you find similarity there. Okay, another update. <coughs> Scan Mission Pyramid. Oh, Scan Pyramid's mission. Very interesting uh, story. I'll, uh, hopefully I'll stay under the hour and, and get through this, but uh, I, um, I, I met uh, a Rolls-Royce engineer, and I know the English are very fond of that company, uh, Rolls-Royce, but you know, we have one in Indianapolis, one of their, one of their uh, uh, divisions is uh, in Indianapolis, and I actually used to do work for that company uh, when it was uh, Allison's and before Rolls-Royce bought it. But uh, Eric Wilson is a Rolls-Royce engineer. He's got a double masters in mechanical, electrical engineering. Brilliant guy. He contacted me. Not so brilliant move. But uh, anyway, he'd read my, read my book and was inspired by it. And, uh, and so we got to talking and, you know, I introduced him to Robert. And then he, uh, he got uh, really excited about this scam pyramid and what it revealed. He, he, uh, his excitement was not necessarily what it was revealing, but um, the partners and the stakeholders that were behind it. And you know, you have French alternate energy, French computer science, Japan University, uh, you have Japan high energy physics research, uh, French Center for Scientific Research, all these stakeholders that want to find Khufu's burial chamber. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I'm not a consp conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I'm a skeptic. <laughs> well, speaking of skeptics, I'm a true skeptic, believe me. The, the people who debunk on the internet, they're not real skeptics, because a real skeptic will be skeptical of his own ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the uh, very high-powered and uh, sophisticated partnership there, uh, looking for, uh, using different methods, looking for uh, Khufu's mummy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like watching uh, C-SPAN in America. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is unbelievable. I can't believe this. Um, and so what they found was the, this, um, this extra space, which was above the, the Grand Gallery. And that uh, right after that, uh, that was found, and uh, I get a call from Eric, and, hey, Chris. I said, yeah, what? He said, that, uh, that new discovery by the Scan Pyramid mission, uh, I know what that is. And I'm like, you know what it is? Uh, we don't even have really good data on it. You know, the, the, the thing's horizontal, it's, uh, it's on, on an angle, the, the resolution is very, very low. Um, you know, until we can get good hard physical measures, but do we really know what we've got? And he goes, no, no, it's a space and uh, it's, it, it's really necessary for your power plant to work. And I'm like, okay, th this is a, a Rolls-Royce engineer, he knows more than me about electrical stuff. Um, so I, I said, okay, I'll buy it, what, what is it? He said, it's a preamp. In fact, if you didn't have it, then your, your uh, theory on the, the uh, Giza power plant probably won't work. And for that to work, all you would need is for a, it to be filled with quartz sand. And if it was filled with quartz sand and if there were connectors to the, the northern shaft, then you would have uh, a preamp, a functional preamp. And, uh, well, well, I'm not gonna argue with him. Okay, that sounds very exciting. Where do we go with it? And he says, well, we need to go to Egypt. I said, well, I happen to be going next March. Do you want to go? Yep, I want to go. So he went along with me in March on a uh, techno tour. And uh, 
I had a great time. So there's Eric. Ahmed El Gendi we met, director of the Great Pyramid. And there's uh, my good friend Hamada Anwar, legal counsel. And Eric is uh, having the time of his life. Uh, uh, interesting story. We're, <coughs> we're, in, uh, we're in Aswan and they find out, oh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers are playing at the, at the Giza Plateau. And it's going to be Friday night and we're, we're not due to get, get home until Saturday morning. And Eric said, oh, I want to go see them. And other couple said, yeah, I want to go see them. And so uh, they, they left the tour and uh, bought tickets to fly home. But the, uh, the tickets to see the show, uh, Ahmed El Gindi uh, is giving them a pass, so they were going to be his guests. Well, at the same time, El Sisi, the president, was at Aswan, and he was uh, in, in some kind of a, a conference, a convention there, and security was extremely tight. So, uh, as it turns out, long story short, uh, Eric and his group didn't get to the Giza Plateau uh, until late, and just in time to hear Red Hot Chili Peppers say, Good night, Cairo! <laughs> Uh, you talk about one crestfallen engineer. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the interesting thing was, uh, Hamed was, uh, felt sorry for him, and he said, well, you know, the Scam Pyramid uh, team are going to be on uh, the, the plateau tomorrow. Um, why don't you come up and join them? And Eric says, oh, I'd love to. So he uh, went up to the Giza Plateau, and spent time with the Scam Pyramid team, and they were having trouble with their equipment. They, uh, there was some electrical issue that they were having. Uh, Eric uh, dove in, helped them out, and, uh, and made the repairs. Amazing. What an ama amazing experience, right? Uh, I tell you, I've, I've said it often, uh, you know, e going to Egypt is like a, uh, a pilgrimage for engineers. It's a, an engineer's paradise. So then another guy who, as a result of my uh, friendship with Robert, showed up on the pic in the picture, and his name is Friedem and Freund. Uh, very credential, NASA Senior Research, NASA Ames, uh, certainly uh, somebody who one would listen to. But since 1997, he had been um, doing research on earthquake lights. And it was his objective or hope or dream that instead of uh, waiting for an earthquake to happen and then, you know, uh, dealing with the aftermath, that there would be some way that they could actually uh, predict that an earthquake was going to happen. And so he was collecting data. Um, there's also, I mean, you know, when it comes to earthquake, the earthquake uh, in a killer in Italy was, uh, it, there was actually people that went to jail because they didn't follow due diligence or that it, the uh, population wasn't warned and uh, public safety wasn't uh, taken care of. But uh, so he had uh, been very well aware of that. And uh, I'm wanting to, uh, wanting to do something that would um, benefit society. He thought that studying earthquake lights would give him information because one of his observations was, through his access to uh, satellite data, was that uh, <clears throat> right before an earthquake, there seems to be a higher l level of uh, earthquake lights. And essentially, his research has, um, has revealed that if you have, sorry, if you have, uh, if you have the, uh, the ground moving, not just, not just uh, the, the granite, and granite certainly, but also even limestone, that there are, there are characteristics of the limestone and the granite that when they, uh, when they go crunch, or when there's movement, then um, electrons are released and electromagnetic uh, energy flows. 
in the, in the earth, um, these, this, this flow will uh, seek uh, the highest ground. So you will find it particularly uh, on higher ground around, the, uh, around mountains and uh, certainly in the case of Aquila there was a mountain range uh, <coughs> on both sides. It was uh, in, the, in like the perfect spot but those earthquake lights appeared before the earthquake and they were in the hills, they were not in the valley. And then uh, the other research that came up was study reveals Great Pyramid of Giza can focus electromagnetic energy. And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I was getting emails uh, from people, hey Chris, you know, it, sounds, it looks like you were right, looks like you were right. And I was, I, I was, uh, it's a piece of the puzzle, um, it's not everything. Um, and, you know, in terms of um, proving the Giza power plant, there's a lot more to go through in order to really uh, nail that down uh, completely. I uh, already went through that one. Anyway, besides obvious benefits from such a power source, we also should consider the benefits that could be gained by utilizing such a machine in geological unstable areas of the planet. California might eventually become the United States energy mecca with the Great Pyramid drawing off energy that is building up within the San Andreas Fault. A fanciful, fanciful idea? Perhaps not. So, anyway, back to Eric. <laughs> Eric uh, had been involved with, he's involved with uh, uh, Purdue University in Lafayette. It's, uh, they have a, a power uh, a power generation uh, uh, department, and uh, there was a student there who, who was working on um, a an acoustic engine. And uh, with working with her, uh, and I asked him before I put this PowerPoint presentation together, can I share? any of the information and right now it's proprietary so I can't <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anecdotally I can tell you that as he was working with her um, and the the design of the system that she had um, if you had taken all the elements of the Great Pyramid and arranged, arranged them in a different way you would find them in her machine. And even some of the uh, ratios and proportions he advised her on, uh, uh, it was actually inspired by the Great Pyramid. So he presented an article to the uh, <coughs> to American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, he, he presented that in August of this year. And in this article, he presented a, uh, a, a theory uh, that um, you could actually build an acoustic engine inside a mountain uh, to draw off energy. Uh, he cited uh, Freedom and Freund's work where Friedemann had actually uh, done the work and the, the lab test to determine the uh, electron flow through the rock. And he'd also determined that uh, the rock would only have to move angstroms. It's not like it would, you know, have to, uh, have to be uh, vibrating wildly in order for that, that phenomenon to occur. Um, <coughs> so he presented uh, Friedemann's work and then at the end he comes to designing or presenting the idea that you would have thermoacoustic engine um, and that was basically the design. Oh, and one thing he told me that I found fascinating was when he was working with this uh, graduate student at Purdue, um, he asked him, well, how do you start this thing? I mean, you know, what's your power input? And, oh, she says, well, I just wrapped the bottom with a hammer. 
So, <laughs> the, the, and then it just functions. So all it takes is, a, is a one rap of the hammer and the acoustic engine works. Sounds almost too good to be true, right? But then uh, coming to the acoustic coupling, um, he has some very interesting things to say that uh, would indicate that maybe he was paying attention when he had my book open. Um, the power plant using proven subsystem technologies will benefit when placed in locations of natural rock and structured with acoustic chambers of stone tightly fit without mortar. <laughs> Sound familiar? All right. So that's the um, coupled oscillator and some of the latest research. I promise I will be more articulate when I write my book. Um, promises sometimes are broken, but this time I think I can do it. Um, I'm coming up on an hour, so I'll be uh, finishing up shortly, but just a, um, a little preview. Tomorrow we'll be going to the British Museum, and I thought I would uh, show you uh, one of the principal artifacts that I, I will be talking about when I go there. Carolyn Wise will, uh, you know, be a, a lot more informative of everything else there, but I will be talking about Ramses and uh, essentially <coughs> the uh, engineering, the precision, the geometry, the symmetry. And this is the, uh, the British Museum, Ramses which is actually more precise than the one you, you will find outside the Temple of Luxor. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing uh, piece of work and a total surprise to me when you consider that if you take a photograph, and I took a photograph trying to get as, as symmetrical or, or close out as the, to the central axis as possible, and then take that photograph, make a transparency, flip it, uh, and then hold it over the original, and you'll see that the left side matches the right side. Um, and even the di dimensionally, and these are approximate dimensions, they're not uh, actual dimensions, but uh, you see that's within two decimal points on the, the jawline. It's an amazing thing. But also, features that people who have worked in manufacturing wouldn't find surprising, and those are mistakes. Um, the, uh, the mistake on this Ramses statue is the, the, the cutter that was cutting the lip uh, dug into the face, uh, dug too far in. And you can see the, uh, the undercut in the corner. And so, in order to accommodate that, compensate for it, they, uh, they cut the lips further in so that they would cut most of the mistake out. Otherwise, if they'd have left the, the, those lips uh, <coughs> the, same, uh, the same level as the, uh, the vermilion border, then uh, that undercut would have been more pronounced. So uh, that's what we'll see tomorrow. I thought I would show these for you tonight so that you can look for that tomorrow and uh, you'll, have, you'll be armed with a little more information than what I could provide to you in the field. And <clears throat> so with that, uh, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. It's wonderful to be back in my home country and sharing it with friends like you. Thank you.